Morning, happy Sabbath. Can you hear me? All right. I've certainly been blessed already. I'm going to move this mic. Although that might be the one working. Uh, I'm excited for us to just continue through our Deep Calling series. I hope that it's been a blessing to all of you as we have been going through different things and, and, and seeing what it looks like for us to walk and live as disciples of Jesus. Uh, I just want to have a word of prayer before we open up the word. Dear Father, thank you for, for today. Thank you for bringing us here to this place. Um, it's been a little bit hot for San Diego. I've had to kind of get used to it, Lord, but I'm just grateful for the blessings that have been here before us, God. We ask now that as we open up your word and spend some time exploring what it means to serve, that you would be with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was in uh, Michigan, in seminary, there was a guy who I looked up to when I was at, um, when I was an undergrad at Southern, um, and he went to seminary also, he was a year ahead of me, and he asked me this question, we were talking about places uh, of, of where we could work, right, so you, you have to, um, you're in school and you also have your practicum, right, so you go to a church and you're kind of engaging in different places, he was kind of, we were talking about like what we were looking for and kind of this next experience, and he was saying, man, I just want a, a church that serves. Then he turned and asked me this question. And this question has actually been a question that has come up probably in every church I've ever worked at. And they asked this question. They said, if your church burnt down tomorrow, would your community notice? If your church burnt down tomorrow, would your community notice? And then he asked another question. If your church burnt down tomorrow, would your community miss it? Would they be like, man, finally we got more parking? Man, finally. They, they block the street all the time. Or would they actually miss it? They'd say, man, they did so much. They were, they were engaging in so much meaningful work. Or they were there for me when I needed help. And he went a step further, which is kind of where it got a little dicey, a little bit even more personal. He said, if Christianity went extinct, would people notice? Would the community notice? Would the world notice? Would they miss it? Would they miss all these Christians and their beliefs and, and the things that they did? Would they miss it? Then he took it one step further. If somehow Seventh-day Adventists no longer existed, will people notice? Will people miss it? Will they miss Adventists? Like, man, they, they did so much. They, were, they, were, they, were, they really spoke about the power of Jesus. Would they miss your church, would they miss Christians? Would they miss Adventism? When we were in L.A. on the mission trip, there was a pastor. We were in the, the community of Watson. The pastor looked at, at, at our group, and, and it felt like conjecture for a moment. I've really been reflecting on what he said. But he said, man, if the church would just get more involved, we'd have less homelessness. If they would get more involved. If 70, he said if 70% of churches got involved, or actually, he might have even said 30%. Now that I think about it, I might have got the numbers flipped. But he said, if, if more churches just engaged, we'd have less issues with homelessness, less people hungry, less people on the street. And I was like, ah, man, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. And as I reflected, I feel like maybe we can't solve all the issues, but we can solve some. And I believe we have been asked by God to do that. As I've heard numerous complaints, I... I hear complaints from people, from, from younger people, people I went to school with, people I grew up with, and their challenges with the church. It oftentimes centers on the fact that the church doesn't make a difference in the lives of people. That they sort of get caught up in themselves and, and kind of what they do on a weekly basis, on the service, on, on menial things like, like carpet colors, like, like all these different things. And, and they aren't actually stepping out and serving and engaging with their community and engaging with people. When I think about what it means to be a disciple, I believe we as the church have the opportunity to demonstrate to people in a visible sense what is actually invisible, right? We have this, the, uh, many times people will say, oh, well, I can't actually see God. But the church has the opportunity to give some visibility to that, to show who God is through our actions. Serving is at the very core of what Jesus did when Jesus was on earth. Jesus was found in places that you wouldn't expect a religious or church person to be. Right? He was around people who were like, man, I, that guy's from the church down the street. Should he really be here right now? Jesus was found in places that, that, that demonstrated humility and demonstrated his, his, his life of service. And, and as he is with the disciples and he 
washes their feet and they're like, oh Jesus, I thought this was about something totally different. I thought we were going to be, be riding and, and people would, be, would, would, would recognize how great we are and they'd be like, oh, th- those are the Christians, those are the people that, that follow, they're with the cool guy. Jesus is like, no, 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 it's about service. And as he washes their feet, he puts the towel over his shoulder and says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now you should go and do the same. He told the disciples that service is what he came for. He came to serve a humanity that was broken and lost. But his heart was moved with compassion. That's what brought him to service. So when we think of the call to serve, and as we've gone through this series, I have pretty much given you three points. And, I, and, and yesterday I was kind of like, man, I'm going to cut one out. And I was like, ah, let me just keep with you know, how I normally do it. So we got three. Well, we'll start with the first one. And the first one is the call to serve invites us to live in awareness. The call to serve invites us to live in awareness. I've heard people say many times, ignorance is bliss. Have you guys heard that one before? Ignorance is bliss. But I've also heard that knowledge is power. Right? So they kind of are, are, are counteracting each other. And When it comes to how we serve, I believe at the core of service, as I mentioned earlier, is compassion. Many theologians and philosophers have identified three aspects of of compassion. The first one is feeling, thinking, and then doing. So that's kind of the process for compassion. You you feel what's you you feel it, and and you begin to to take on what, what you're seeing. You think about it, and then you move. Faith in Act, public faith in action, says this. A key part of what it means to serve and walk in compassion is to have love for the needy and suffering, leading you to experience their pain as also being painful to you. As you become more aware of what those around you are dealing with, their suffering matters to you, and it starts to influence your own feelings. Have you ever been there where where you see something and you can't stop thinking about it? You can't stop feeling it? You you, you have a dream about it that night, or or, or it's just bothering you. It stays in, in, in your mind. See, living in awareness is something that Jesus also did. So often in our modern day, we kind of paint Jesus as, as maybe being a little bit aloof or being uh, kind, of, kind of separated from, from the challenges and the issues of people. Because maybe it might be a little bit political to think about some of the things that he cared about. right? It, but, but Jesus actually looked at and, and understood the complexities of the situations that people were dealing with, and he felt compassion, and it moved him to service. Jesus was aware of the hardship, the poverty, the sickness that plagues the world, then as well as now. Jesus knows the story behind every one of our missed payments. Every every time when we're we're told that, oh, hey, the rent got raised again. That just happened to me. It sucks. Jesus is aware of the positive tests, the depression, the anxiety, the stress that we all feel. Jesus feels it, too, as if it's his own, and it moves him to service you to join me in the book of Luke chapter 7. I didn't put all the, ver- uh, the, wor- the, uh, the verses on the screen, so feel free to, to open up the word with me. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 17. And Jesus finds a widow here. And here we get a window into the compassion that Jesus feels. John, uh, Luke, Luke 7, verse 11 to 17. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. The young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. We stop, we'll stop at 15. So Jesus enters into the city gates. Uh, a dead man is carried out in front of him as he's coming in. What a tremendous welcome to a new city. He's greeted by a man being carried out who was dead. But the text highlights so, some of the backstory on this, this man that was carried out. The text mentioned, Luke mentions that he is the only son of his mother. And then he goes on to say that the mother was also a widow. And I want you to think about this for a second, right? Jesus sees the situation and Luke mentions it, right? Luke could have just mentioned there was a dead man and his mom was sad. 
But he, he adds in a few elements, right? He says this was her only son. He says that she was a widow. And you have to think about, there, there's psychological differences here, right? There, there's economic differences for this woman because she also had already lost her husband. And now her son, which was pretty much the means to, pretty much her retirement plan, her, her, her pathway forward has now passed away. And so Luke mentions that because Luke takes into account, hey, like, there's some problems here. And I want to highlight that, that Jesus was aware of those details. It wasn't something that he just kind of, oh, we, someone sad and, and, and they passed away. Jesus understood the complexity of that situation. He, he was aware of the spiritual, psychological, and economic realities of that situation. Jesus already knows the realities of this mom. Jesus probably, as this is happening, Jesus understands that this mom would probably wake up really early in the morning, cook breakfast, and jump to her job, leave something for her son. She'll work while her son's at school or at work, run back home, make something so he can eat lunch or eat dinner, and then she'll jump to her other job. Jesus knew that they were just trying to keep a roof above their head and food on the table and, and out of the cold. And Jesus feels that pain with the woman. And it moves, it stirs something up inside of him. He isn't stoic about it. He isn't just sort of nonchalant. It stirs something inside of his heart. And the text describes him as being moved with compassion. And he says to the woman, don't cry. Just for the record, it's probably not always a great thing to say when someone is having a moment, when they're sad. Don't look at them and be like, don't cry, cheer up. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. But in this statement, I believe Jesus isn't just dismissing her feelings. He's actually saying, ma'am, there's going to be a moment when I wipe away all tears. That there's going to be something greater that comes after this. What you're feeling right now is not the end of the story. Where there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There will be no more pain. Jesus gives her a glimpse into that moment, in that, in that situation. He says to her, don't cry. There's going to be something greater on its way. Then Jesus walks over to the open coffin, touches and raises up the boy, and reunites him with his mother. Jesus was aware of the complexities of this situation. He understood what the woman was dealing with, what the widow was dealing with. Jesus understands the reality of situations today, even in moments we don't. How many people do we know? suffering, dealing with different things, and just need someone to understand where they're coming from. And maybe they don't have someone, but I believe we have been offered that opportunity. When we were in LA, we, we served from Monday through Friday, but technically Tuesday through Friday. The reason I say that is on Monday, the first day, we, we were kind of we're, you would think, like, all right, we're just going to hit the ground running. Like, we're going to go out and we're going to start serving into the community. But the company that we went with sort of took a step back and said, okay, we're going to drive through the city of L.A., we're going to drive through all the different neighborhoods, we're going to tell you about the neighborhoods, we're going to pray over these neighborhoods. Because they wanted us to be aware of what was going on. We, we started having conversations about stuff that we didn't really understand, the way, the way economics are, are, are working out, the reason why some people are being priced out of their neighborhood, the reason why some people don't have food on their table, well, this whole idea of food deserts. Like we were having all these conversations about things that we didn't really know about yet. Maybe we, or maybe we don't always think about. We're just thinking, oh, we'll hand them something, or we'll give, we'll give this away, or I'll pray for them. He's like, no, I need you to understand specifically what we're praying for. And I believe Jesus understands that there are situations in life that are challenging. Oftentimes we just see people and think we, we know what's going on. We think we know the whole story. But there's so much more. And I invite you in your own San Diego community to, to begin to be aware of what's happening. What people are dealing with. Because it might be different than your own. And they're complex. They're, they're tied to so many different other situations. There's ripple effects. And Jesus was aware of that, and as he came into that realization, he felt compassion. He felt compassion. We think about the questions, what are the biggest problems in your community? What are the biggest challenges facing your community? I invite you to step into awareness, because out of that can grow compassion, and out of compassion, service and closeness.
Next one is the call to serve invites us closer. So I'm going to tack on to that closer to each other. Closer to each other. We live in a world of separation, right? It's pretty clear that there are numerous ways to separate yourself from somebody else. I mentioned two weeks ago how people just enjoy knowing that you're there, but you don't bother them, right? Like, that's kind of the world we live in. Like, I just, like, you don't, don't bother me, and, and, and everything is good. We don't live in a world where closeness is seen as something positive, especially after a pandemic. But Jesus tore, I, I believe, Jesus tore at the walls of separation. Jesus was like, no, no, no. We're, we need to do this a little bit differently. I think what, what it means to serve, what it means to be a disciple of, of, of me, looks a little bit different than the way we do it. One of the ways that Jesus is described is, he's described as being incarnate. And incarnate basically would be to touch and to be touchable, to serve and to be served. Right? Incarnate means that you're right there alongside of people, that, that you're, you're, you're right alongside of them, you understand what's going on. And, and the reality is so many times in the scripture, Jesus doesn't just say the right thing. I think so often we get caught up in saying the right thing. Like, oh, I'm in this situation, what do I say? What do I say? But Jesus touches someone. He comes alongside of them and sits with them. Even when societal norms told them that he didn't have to, or that wasn't right, or that was incorrect, or that was wrong. Think about how many times in scripture that happens. But I want to hone in on probably the most familiar one for us. If you read the newsletter yesterday, I wrote a little bit about the Good Samaritan story. Most of you have heard that before, right? Everyone? All right, all right. just want to make sure. All right, cool. The Good Samaritan. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, really quick. We're all in Luke. We're going to be in Luke the whole time, so it's all good. We don't have to go too far. All right, Luke 10, verse 25. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. Some versions say, the man trying to justify himself. Ask Jesus, who is my neighbor? I want to point out first that the man knows the scriptures, right? The man is well-versed. He, he knows theology. He knows of whom he probably is speaking to. He, he knows everything. But he asks, what must I do to be saved? Just trying to make sure that he's on the right path. And some of us have been there before, before we judge the guy. We're like, Jesus, what do I got to do to be saved? Just tell me. I need the blueprint. And Jesus, he says, hey, this is, you know the law. Live out the law. But then in verse 29, it says, he wants to justify his actions. So he asks, who is my neighbor? Here's the thing, right? The man is basically asking, who are the people that I need to come close to? When he's asking, your neighbor is the person right next to you, right? He's like, okay, who are the people that I, that, that I need to keep close? Right? There's got to be some that I keep close and maybe others that aren't as close. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Like, there, there's the people, like, these are my neighbors. Yeah, these, these are my people. This is my, my crew. These are the people that are like me. They understand me. He's like, I just want to make sure. And, and, and Luke says the man is trying to justify himself. So that must mean that there's some that aren't his neighbor. That there's some that he believes aren't his neighbor. See, I, as a religious person, he, he may have believed that there were some people that were meant to be kept at a distance. Because we can't possibly love first everyone. We can't do that for everybody, right? That would be crazy, right? We, we, can't love the, we can't love first the people that speak a different language than me, right? We can't love first the neighbor who, who has these issues and, and, we don't speak, and, and we don't like the same music as them, right? That we don't go to the same church as them, right? It, it, I can't be the neighbor of somebody who doesn't have the same beliefs as me because what do we have in common then? I can't be a neighbor with someone who, who, who is a completely different, who's a different skin color than me, who, who's from the other side of the country, from the other side of the world. That can't possibly be my neighbor. He says, who are the people that I need to keep close? It's important for us to realize that the story of the Good Samaritan is born out of someone asking, who are the people that I need to keep close? Who is my neighbor? Like, that's, that's where it comes from. He's asking this question of, are there people that I can push away? And Jesus then says, in verse 30 to 37, 
Jesus replies with a story, as Jesus does. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. He was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, and, and when the, the man saw him lying there, he crossed by the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there. He also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I will pay you the next time I'm here. Verse 36. Now which of these three would you say was the neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. Verse 37. The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I believe, PV, that... Jesus invites the church to go and do likewise. Many, many theologians believe, and I, pro and I believe this too, that, that the man probably couldn't even say the word Samaritan when Jesus asked who showed him mercy. So he's just like, oh, well, the one who showed him mercy. Because I can't possibly say the word Samaritan. That can't possibly be on my lips. I don't want to make unclean lips, right? I believe Jesus tells this story to point out that there are people who are in great need that we pass over. You guys probably already know that. But, but here's the thing. It's not because we don't care. I actually believe it's not because we don't care. I believe it's because we care too much about the wrong thing. We care too much about the wrong thing. We care about perception. We judge each other by those that we are close to. We often talk about how we become like the people we're around. And, and so for the Jews, as they see the Samaritan, they're like, man, if I'm around a Samaritan, man, that's going to that's gonna make me. It's going to contaminate me. That's going to mess me up. That's going to mess my family up if I hang out with this guy. That's going to put us at risk. We may have been told to not be around certain people because that will affect us. Or if we're friends with them, or if we're around them, then it could send the wrong message to our family. If they see us post a picture on Instagram with this person, they're going to be like, man, what is Stephen doing? Doesn't he know better? Didn't his parents raise him better? Isn't he a Christian? Isn't he Adventist? Isn't he a pastor? I mentioned in the newsletter that I was, that I used to love watching these Nest Christian videos. Anyone know what I'm talking about? These, like, these little animated ones? You guys know what I'm talking about. And they used to be on tapes. Right, I told you to Google if you don't know what a tape is, VHS, VCR. I'm old enough to know what that is, but also young enough to know when they phased out, all right? So I, I lived in both worlds, okay? Uh, we were just talking, I'm a, Robert and I were talking, I'm a young millennial, so I've seen some of both sides. I know the world without media. All right, anyways, we'll move on, because now, now I sound old. Um, I used to watch these, these videos. I used to love watching them Saturday afternoon, anytime I could. Sometimes my dad would be like, watch one of these, and then you can watch a, a regular movie. And one of my favorite ones was The Good Samaritan. And I, I hadn't seen it in probably about 20 years. And yesterday, as I was going through my sermon, just kind of figuring out, I was like, man, I want to go back and watch it. Let me just go back and see if I can find it on YouTube or something. So I found it wasn't even on YouTube. It was actually on, like, some other platform. Probably gave my computer a virus. But I watched it over there. I was able to see the whole episode. And it was, first of all, you have that moment where you're like, man, I used to watch this. Like, I used to think this was good animation. So you have that moment, right? But then as you're watching, you're like, man, this was kind of deep. Like, as a kid, you like, there, there's obviously, in, in some of those videos, I don't know if you remember, like, there'd be characters, and they were kind of, like, a little bit, like, overacting, right? It just, like, it was, like, really funny. Their intonation, the way they talk, the way they dress, the way they'd walk. Like, as a kid, you're kind of laughing at that stuff, and you're like, oh, like, this is also about Jesus. But I was, as I was watching, I watched towards the end, and I was showing my wife, like, oh, like, this is what I used to watch. She's like, oh, wow, great. Uh... There were two lines, right? So, so you have the priest who passes by, and it's just like, man, if I wasn't on the Lord's work, I would have had time to stop. And then another guy who, he's like eating snacks, and then he kind of walks by, and he's like, oh, well, feel bad for the guy. Got to keep moving. Then there's the Samaritan, right? He sees him, comes, brings him to the inn, bursts into the inn, and, the, and the, the two guys that passed by were actually at the same inn. So they see him come in, right, in, in this portrayal. And as he puts it, he puts him on the table, and, 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 the, and the innkeeper and the innkeeper's son are just like, man, what a great guy. 
You're so awesome. He says two things. The first thing he says is, I couldn't just leave him to die now, could I? I couldn't just leave him there to die. And he, and he begins to tell the other people, like, I bet if you guys were to pass by, you would have stopped. He, it must have happened after you passed. I couldn't just leave him there to die. And I thought about this, right? Because what if the Samaritan had gotten caught up in the fact that no one liked him? What if he got caught up in the fact that maybe if he does this, like, those people think I'm unholy. Those people think I'm, I'm not a great person. What if he gets caught up in all that and he's like, maybe I should leave him there to die because I'm good as dead to them, right? Like, what if he had that process, but instead, compassion fills his heart and he says, no, no, no. I can't just leave him here. I got to do something about this. And he empathizes with the man. He feels the very thing that stirs in the heart of Jesus, compassion, and that moves him towards service. He sees this man as a brother and not an enemy. Even though they might speak a different language, they speak the same language. That's the language of love, the language of Jesus Christ. Not as someone different than him. He sees him as his brother. And he comes closer to the man. In the same way Jesus would come close to us. The next line that hit me was when he says, I just did what anyone would do. He says that a couple times. I just did what anyone would do. Here's the thing. The reality is, not anyone would do that. Right? Like, like, it's so rare that we're like, man, like, they're a great person. We see someone do a nice act, we're like, man, you're, you're a good person. Because it's true that not anyone would do that. Yet when the, heart of Je- when the heart of Jesus fills us, we see no other natural way to live than to step in and serve other people. We come close to their pain. We can't, we can't imagine not helping them. And for us, it's, yeah, I just did what anyone would do. I did what any follower of Jesus would or should do. Sorry if I'm stepping on toes. Hope you didn't wear flip-flops or something. See, we are not promised to be able to solve or erase suffering by our acts, but we are called to transform it. Pledging that by loving one another, even through pain, we will then find a deeper life and offer and call people into a greater way. The more that our heart is broken for what breaks God, we find ourselves opening ourselves to strangers and people different than us, people that are called despised, people that are cast onto the fringes. We will see more and more into the holy path that Jesus has for us, where there are no exceptions for people. We're all part of one body, and all of us are God's children, and we are invited to go and do likewise. Serving invites us closer, closer to each other, closer to those we may be uncomfortable with, and closer to the kingdom of God. And finally, the call to serve brings the kingdom of God near. Dallas Willard says, the gospel is less about how to get into the kingdom of heaven after you die, and more about how to live in the kingdom of heaven before you die. Jesus was asked about the kingdom of God. He was asked, hey, when will we know the kingdom of God has come? When when will we know? What's going to be the moment? What's going to be the sign? That was their favorite question to ask him. What will be the sign? And in Luke 17, so flip over to Luke chapter 17. We're still in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. Jesus gets asked this question by the Pharisees. 17, verse 20, Luke. Now, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look, here he is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Some versions say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And even as Jesus begins his ministry in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus starts after everything. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, as we receive Jesus into our lives, the way in which we live it out is what gives evidence of the kingdom of God. And as the Lord works through us and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are beginning to bring the kingdom of God near. When God works on our heart, we begin to make the invisible kingdom visible. We may not be able to visit everyone in need. We may not be able to to save the day for everyone. We we see situations around the world, around our community. We may not be able to respond to all of them, but we can reach one. We can step out a little bit more. We can pull a little bit closer. Because when we do that, we bring the kingdom of heaven near. 
when we invest in the lives of others as brothers and sisters, we make the gospel and scripture come alive. It also represents the church very differently because the church is made up not of this building. It's made up of you and I. And when we engage with people and serve, the gospel and the kingdom of God become visible. I want to close with a story. When I lived in Florida, we lived in a pretty small town. Um, and our town had about 10,000 people, 10,000 right on the next town, the adjacent town. Um, our, our, the time it was like really packed was like January, February, because everyone came from up the north and they started living there. But even then, they were complaining about traffic lived there and a lot of people liked living there because in the country you kind of are separated from city stuff right like you don't have the traffic right you don't have maybe the the crime in the same way you, you don't have the hustle and bustle everyone's a little bit more relaxed houses are cheaper life is a little bit more relaxed you, you kind of feel like you're you're kind of living the country lifestyle that maybe we were called to live we were a small community, and, and we would sometimes, from, from our seat, be like, man, look what's happening out in California. Thank God I don't live there. That would never happen here. Man, thank goodness I don't live in the Middle East. That would never happen here. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? On January 23, 2019, 12.30 p.m., so there, there was a shooting in our town. Probably the only time we ever made the news was at a bank. A bank uh, the bank was SunTrust. There was about three or four of them in between the two towns. And everyone, pretty much almost everyone would go there. Even I went there every now and then. I was actually planning to go that day. There was a shooting at that bank. And a man left a small diner in town, a diner that I had eaten at also. And he went to the bank and shot five employees. And the whole place was, uh, was locked down for two to three hours. They ended up having to drive a... One of the, their, I forget what you call those big, the, the big like Humvee looking vehicles, like they drove it in because he wouldn't come out. He was just inside. It was the only time we made national news. And I remember thinking like, man, how did this happen? Like everyone was reeling, everyone was like, man, how did we get here? And, and, I, and I started feeling all these emotions, right? I'm a pastor, I've been a pastor for about a year at that point, and I, and I started praying and I was like, man, I, I wanna help, I wanna be part of something good. I, I'm angry about this happening. I want to do something to heal this. God, help me. I went to school all these years. I live in this town. What can I do to make a difference? I just want to be part of good. And I called one of my friends who was a nurse in the area. He actually worked in, at, at the jail in, in the community. And we talked and we prayed about it together. I vented to him. And I was like, man, I don't know what to do. I feel helpless. This is a small town and I can't even make a difference here. I can't even serve. What, what am I supposed to do? We talked, we prayed, we said, all right, we're going to sleep on it. In the morning, I texted him, and I was like, man, what if we just, I, I was like, I know the other banks are open. What if we just took some flowers, took some cards, and just visited with the employees? We did that at, at one of the other banks, because they all know each other. So we go, we, we drive there, we, we go to our, our, our local supermarket, get some stuff, drive to the bank. And the cops are patrolling outside of all the banks in the city or in the town. So outside of the bank we're going to, which is right across from the supermarket, there were cops everywhere. Just making sure, like literally escorting you to your teller. As we go in, we, the cop looks over and he's like, hey, like, how can I help you guys? And we just told him, hey, like, we're just here. We just want to offer some comfort. We're here to pray. I was like, I'm a local pastor. Um, we just want to offer some support. If we need to just drop the flowers off and the cards, that's fine. And he's like, no, no, come in. They'll love that. He's like, the tellers have been struggling all day. So we go in. We're escorted by the officers. And we saw the employees. And, and, and the officer explains why we're there. And, and the tellers just start weeping. They're like, man, it's been so hard. We started listening to the stories. And they were saying, man, one of them said, I got transferred three days ago to this branch. I used to work at the other one. I know the people that, that got shot. Like, like I know them, and they, they were navigating through survivor's guilt, navigating through all these different feelings and whether or not they're going to be safe. And, 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 and they shared memories of the people that they knew. But I'll never forget what this one guy said. I'd actually seen this. Our town was this small, so I had seen this guy like at the gym. Like, pretty big guy, pretty, pretty tall. I'd seen him around. I knew he worked at the bank. We didn't, he didn't know that I knew him. 
it's kind of, sounds kind of weird now, but anyways. Um, <laughs> you know, the, but anyways, he was, he was sobbing the entire time. Didn't really say a word. Like, I came in there, he hugged me. He hugged me again, and he said these words. Thank you for bringing heaven with you today. Because it felt like hell was winning until now. Thank you for bringing heaven with you today, because it felt like hell was winning until now. We shared a long hug. I prayed for the group. And while it was a small act, family, I take hope in knowing that many small acts help to bring heaven near. So my question for you, PV, is how is God inviting you to bring the kingdom of God near? What is the Holy Spirit leading you to put into action? How can you bring heaven to this world? How can you use your gifts and passions to bring heaven near to someone? It doesn't have to be a travel across the globe. It could be. It could just be a travel across your neighborhood, across the supermarket. How can you bring heaven to this world? Let's pray. God, we ask that you lead us, Lord. There are so many things that detract us and push us away from serving God, but you've called us to step in and bring heaven near to those around us. Lord, may we know that our lives and our actions help to bring near the invisible kingdom of God. May we know that you desire to be incarnate in us so that we can point others to you. And may we, Paradise Valley, Seventh-day Adventist Church, come alive in service and bless those around us. And may we love first because you first loved us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stay seated while the organ plays. <laughs> 